So, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear us? Can you see us? How was the food? <laughs> uh, I'm really thrilled uh, to share the stage with such incredible artists. I'm really happy, and uh, I would like to thank Sharjah Foundation to allow such meeting to happen. And uh, it's really a pity that Zainab will not be able to join us, uh, but I'll, I'll try to give, because I'm familiar with her work, and some of her uh, colleagues are here, so we will try to give you also an idea about the different way uh, she's engaging with different communities. Um, uh, actually, th this panel will allow us to learn different aspects of engagement between artists and art, contemporary art practices and different communities. And I would like this also panel to untangle a bit some of the terms that are used within the contemporary art discourse, like art and community or engaging, etc. because I think it's so diverse. And it uh, also, there are different motivations, different conditions around the art uh, practices. And uh, I will first, uh, of course, the the artists uh, present here today, they are, uh, the practice are very rich that we can spend four hours, but we have one hour and a half. <laughs> so I will keep very uh, strict order of time. And I will ask you uh, different questions. I will start uh, to ask you to make presentations of your practice, focusing on how do you engage with different communities. We'll start with Marwa, Arsanius, and, uh, and then maybe while you are presenting the work, and about the 98 weeks, you, you tell us a bit what motivated you to work in such form. Okay. Okay, um, thank you everyone. Thanks uh, Reem, uh, Ryan, uh, everyone at Charge Art Foundation, Hoor, uh, Tari, <laughs> for inviting us. Uh, and uh, yeah, well, we were asked to respond to the this idea of uh, community formation and uh, what does it really mean and um, well in my case I think I will take the um, example of uh, the 98 weeks research project that uh, I co-founded with Miren Arsanios in uh, Beirut um, it's a funny time to talk about this research project because uh, now it is on hold and uh, we have decided to uh, you know, stop it for uh, a while. Uh, this is due to uh, our um, you know, uh, personal lives and uh, changes in uh, um, also due to funding as well and uh, change in changes in uh, uh, yeah, our own uh, lives and practices. Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> Partly the situation in Beirut, I mean, yeah, uh, maybe we can talk about this as well. Uh, in fact, um, the you, well, you arrive at a time where these kinds of projects I see now are um, not really sustainable. So uh, this project started as a, uh, I mean, the motivation, your question about motivation, the so a project started as um, a continuation of, or a way to continue research outside of academia. And how can this uh, happen? How can research be uh, sort of like para-academic and uh, how can we, um, you know, continue whatever an academic environment um, of research offers but uh, wi while building our own structure. So this is the motivation of the research and um, of the project. And this is also, uh, I mean, it was also a way to think about art structures. Uh, what does it mean to build an art structure and what does it mean uh, to build an art structure that is run by artists and that is really thinking about, uh, you know, uh, putting forward an artist practice. Uh, or art artist practices. So, um, and also how to build a, a community around a specific uh, um, topic of knowledge. So how, how can a sort of like uh, a knowledge production build in itself, build a, a community that then goes beyond the uh, knowledge production. And um, the question would also be 
um, you know, how can this go, uh, how can this knowledge be translated into political praxis as well? So uh, these are really the questions and the motivations that were behind the starting of uh, 98 Weeks Research Project. Um, and, uh, okay, while I'm speaking, I will flip through uh, some slides just to show you um, and give you an idea of how this was uh, formed, because at the beginning of the project, we were using different spaces in the city. And, of course, the project is really um, embedded in the city of Beirut, so um, it does not make sense if we are not there anymore to continue the project. So this is also what I meant by the project is on hold because our lives have changed and uh, the project is very related to uh, our lives, basically. Uh, it never really became an institution that uh, runs by itself and uh, doesn't really have like an institutional structure. Um, and it's more of an um, organization, let's say. Uh, and uh, we started in uh, 2007. So the first research was on the city of Beirut and it was uh, spatial practices uh, and looking at how uh, uh, you know, spatial practices can um, intervene in the history of the city and um, yeah, the present day politics in the city. So, uh, yeah, oh, this I'm is... Sorry to interrupt, maybe we have to say that uh, the, the initial idea was to uh, carry on a, a research project every 98 weeks, right? Okay, that was yes. the <laughs> <laughs> and this is how the, how, yeah. how the project was titled 98 weeks. Okay, I take it, I, I really take it for granted now yeah, when yeah, I talk yeah, about yeah, 98 weeks that this some is like... Some people are not familiar, <laughs> so I thought I should... Uh, okay, so I should do like the basic introduction yes. as well, okay. <laughs> so yeah, so the idea was really to uh, have a, uh, I mean the name uh, is uh, 98 weeks, which is almost two years minus six weeks of vacation. This this is how we had uh, counted it. And to have uh, every two years a specific uh, research uh, topic and uh, carry on this research through different formats, such as workshops, talks, uh, you know, walks in the city, um, etc., uh, seminars, uh, reading groups. So the, all of these forms of uh, research were, um, you know, um, s sort of leading leading us to uh, think about a specific research topic. And uh, many people um, that were, I mean, people that were interested in the same research topic would, um, you know, come and join the sort of like this uh, research community, let's say. Um, and this is how it was organized. And normally, uh, or usually it, it, include the, it included researchers, artists, uh, yeah. writers, Right, you had reading groups, uh, etc. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. So, uh, as I said, one of the main uh, formats of research was the reading group, and uh, yes, of course, it was uh, you know uh, inclusive to many different uh, disciplines, um, and so uh, yeah, it was not only for artists, but although I mean the organization itself works within an art context and an art realm, but it's not. Um, you know, it's a um, sort of a research uh, group, so, uh, yeah. Uh, so, the f as, uh, as you said, like, the first uh, research was uh, really around the city and spatial practices, how can spatial practices deal with the uh, histories and the uh, formation of uh, the city. Uh, later on, we thought that we really needed to have a space, a physical space, so instead of you know going around and doing uh, you know using different spaces in the city to uh, uh, do our uh, project and to carry on our events we decided to have one space and this was uh, the uh, project space that we uh, found in, uh, in um, yeah on armenia street so in the armenian neighborhood in beirut uh, and okay also the, there is this uh, aspect so we were we were one of the first gentrifiers of the area as usual and uh, we had like really cheap rent and you know things were still affordable so and this was only uh, you know 2009 when we uh, started the project space um, yeah so uh, 
this is and then you, the second uh, research was on publication right right so the second uh, research was on historical publications that were published in the arab world yep. uh, and the question of the modernization of the arabic uh, language how this uh, modernization was uh, how these publications or like these historical publications that we worked on were uh, sort of uh, key uh, players in the modernization of language uh, especially in the format of essays, articles, uh, also a uh, very famous uh, poetry publication, Sha'ir. So how these uh, publications played a role in uh, um, the modernization of language in a very specific moment of uh, post-colonial state formation. Um, so uh, this was the on-publication uh, um, pro research project. Uh, where we invited, we had like different collections of these publications and we actually invited readers and writers and uh, writers who had contributed to these publications and uh, also readers uh, of um, uh, these publications to um, uh, reread or choose uh, material from the collections we had and re-read them and produce a new reading of um, you know, either their own writings. And the publications, as I, uh, as I said, were um, yeah, mostly collections from the 50s and the 60s. Uh, the, one of the publications was Al-Hilal, uh, which is an uh, Egyptian, or it, it's published in, uh, Egypt, it was published in Egypt. And the collection from the 50s and 60s that we had was uh, really at the moment where pub pu publishing was nationalized in Egypt. So it carried a lot of the Nasserist ideas and, uh, uh, you know, all of this um, sort of like um, Nasser uh, moment and politics. So this is what was circulating in the publication. Uh, whereas Sha'ar was a more, a, let's say, uh, elitist, or this is how it was uh, uh, perceived and also critiqued by a lot of uh, leftists uh, back then. Uh, so um, th these were like the two publications that we really went uh, into and uh, yeah, and really like... Uh, um Great. And then you started the research on feminism and also yeah. you, you had the research on science fiction. Right to give the people an idea, yeah. but my question to you now, uh, because your work, like your piece Jamila, was actually carrying lots of material from the research that was 98 weeks doing. Uh, in your Jamila's piece, you also had El Hilal magazine, and you had also elements from the feminism and the state feminism, right? And can you tell us? why you didn't work in your own when you came back to Beirut? Why didn't you stay in your studio and do your work? And why did you choose to, that your artistic work be like engaged and involved with such a project that involved many others? Um, because, uh, yeah, I mean... You don't have to have an answer. Yeah, but just I mean, an, uh, no, the... the just <laughs> like, yeah, if yeah. you say I, I liked it that way and <laughs> it was more, uh, yeah. Yeah, I have to say something that after the uh, feminism, the publication research project, we had uh, realized that actually most of our speakers were these older men because these are the ones that were contributing to these uh, magazines, you know. And so uh, we really, this is when we started the feminism uh, research project and thought that, uh, well, there is something that uh, uh, went wrong there. So uh, we really need to fix it. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so this is when the feminism's research project uh, uh, started. And uh, uh, Jamila, I think, was also a kind of a uh, reaction, and uh, not not, uh, not a reaction, let's say, but a kind of a, uh, a reflection on uh, this very uh, uh, issue. And let me differentiate here. Jamila is an artistic project of Marwa Arsanios, not of 98 weeks, right? So uh, it was a reflection on the fact that these magazines carried so much of this uh, sort of like uh, these, as I said, uh, older male uh, uh, writers, uh, because this, is, this was the moment actually where, uh, and this was like, I mean, feminism and, uh, at the moment, I mean, 
in the magazine at least from the 50s and the 60s that we had, yeah. feminism was really uh, promoted as state feminism. So it was like one of the, uh, let's say, Nasserist uh, projects as well. And this is how it was articulated in the magazine itself. Uh, Jamila her, herself was really, I mean, at, at least uh, the image of Jamila was used um, also by Nasserist uh, state propaganda, let's say, and um, she was used as this uh, iconic uh, Algerian fighter and uh, really like, uh, um, you know, circulated, or at least this image and many other images circulated in the magazine in that way. So you had always the, I mean, this, this is the, the covers, all the covers of the magazine, uh, of the Al Hilal magazine are, uh, you have like either these, uh, I don't know, like uh, beautiful looking uh, or posing uh, actresses and stars and, you know, just models, etc. Uh, and the fighters. So you had these two uh, sort of uh, imagery coming from the, the magazine. Uh, the fighters, which were, um, you know, like either the woman holding the gun or the woman that's, you know, an actress or posing um, and treated uh, similarly. So uh, the, 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 your question, your yes. question about, <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm taking One too minute. much time. So your, your question about um, why am I working in this way, it's yes. uh, b because really, I mean, um, I, this is where I'm, com I'm coming from as an artist as well. I'm coming from, I mean, the artwork is not, uh, does not come, you know, um, just from nowhere, out of yeah. nowhere, right? Yeah. It yeah. comes a lot uh, from uh, conversations, from uh, the context itself, yeah. from, uh, you know, all these workshops that we do together, uh, the, all the reading groups. Uh, this is how ideas are formed. And uh, I guess, yeah, e each person that is sort of like participating in these uh, uh, communal uh, uh, knowledge production yeah. moments take their own um, yeah, sort of like take their own ideas and uh, carry them on in their practices. Uh, so definitely, definitely, and also when I, when I was doing an exhibition in Beirut uh, with Ashkel Alwan in 2013, of course, the, uh, this your space was uh, kind of uh, had an influence on how I think about the exhibition or how I even design the exhibition, you know? And also many other artists who started when you did the science fiction, you had Laurent Sabo Hamdan coming on board, Ryan Tabit, you had lots of actually community of artists, researchers, writers, etc. I will talk, I will, I will ask you more questions about the feminism, about your current uh, research and projects, uh, uh, but maybe at towards the end. And now I would like to ask Del to, uh, present completely different kind of uh, community uh, art, the uh, art practices that engage with the community in a different way. We have we are using the same computer, so in between we'll have to switch. Uh, yeah. That should be. There we go. Well, while that loads, good afternoon, and uh, it's a great honour and a privilege to be here, and I thank all involved, and certainly all the elders within the arts communities, but also within our social and family and, and cultural communities for, for, for empowering these kinds of conversations. Oh. Okay, well, so I, I'm currently based in Brisbane, and Culturally, I identify as a Bidjara man, which comes from my grandfather's lineage, but also I have connections with Gungaloo and Garingbul and Gungari uh, traditional peoples from what is now central Queensland in Australia, and they come from my matrilineal lineages as well. So uh, in contemporary life, we, I have responsibility for maintaining all of those, those uh, ways of beings and all of my cultural inheritances. And so I draw upon those in my contemporary art practice. And unfortunately, It's been working very easily. Okay. Shall we, uh, oh, here we go. This is what we'll do. Maybe that will tell the computer to. Can you tell me sure. which between you and Naeem? So Naeem starts and then. Of course. Yay. Yeah. 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 Yay. <laughs> That's right. That's my energy. Bring some authority to it. That's right. <laughs> to, to mediate, uh, moderate. Uh, so, 
as a as a as a, a, a small subheading that I've I've brought to this conversation my own, of my own is uh, cultural continuum, and that has been something that has afforded me a, a, a different kind of agency that I sort of hold quietly, but now it's now it's kind of emerging as a as a conversation. So to place us locally, this is very cr intentionally uh, inaccurate, but a, a circling of what is now known as Central Queensland or the Central Highlands of, of Queensland. And within there are a number of cultural groups who have traditional territories in there responsible for the maintenance and the, uh, and the, and the furthering and of, of uh, the, the cultural stories, the, the song lines and all of the other language and uh, the terms of reference for those individual groups. So I didn't try to delineate this too specifically because that would be inaccurate. But on the central dot there is, is essentially where my cultural home is. And in, in the region of that central dot on this particular map are many, many sandstone rock art galleries and sites of, of great cultural significance, not only to my, our lineages, but across the continent. And then those, those lineages extend beyond in, in uh, interconnectedness from, from that central point. So that locates my contemporary practice and allows me to be here now. And this is the, the actual landscape. So in the, in the top left is an aerial view of Carnarvon Gorge, one of the aerial views. And it is a sandstone country which runs a, along a great dividing range. It runs most of the eastern, con eastern side of the Australian continent. Within there are uh, uh, countless sites of in incredible significance. And it allows me then to draw from those cultural sites, those which are safely, safely uh, um, sort of accessible and sa safe for me to speak about. These are on the uh, now published in the public domain. The territories that I inherit from my grandparents are most of them are under national parks, or if they're not under national parks, um, kind of auspice at this time, they're under mining lease or pastoral lease as well. So in the, the great majority of our wider communities, we're diasporic between the, uh, the, the, the state capital of Brisbane or the eastern seaboard further pushed, you know, six and seven and eight hundred kilometres away from our, our home territories, where we have a responsibility to be to maintain those stories. So these are the, the, the sites of significance. It's known as rock art, but it's, of course, they're, they're, they're places of, of doing and places of action. And I, I, I'll just point out the one on the left is within Carnarvon Gorge, and the other one on the right is at a site of my grandfather's territory on Bidra territory, which is much higher country, at the kind of the peak of on, on the highest points of, of Queensland. So these are these are some of the frames that uh, that I bring to me to my contemporary practice, and the frames that my family and I speak from uh, when we talk about what we do as as makers and thinkers. And so from here. I've been afforded the privilege to then extend upon our cultural inheritance and bring these uh, practices of, of visual expression into contemporary galleries. So we've been able to, uh, through all of our processes, my, uh, have access to our cultural pigments, the ochres, and bring them into gallery context when we're talking about national discussions. This was a, a, an exhibition held between three venues in Sydney and it was termed the National New Australian Art in 2017. And if we're, if we're looking at sort of community and, 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 uh, and sort of mobilisation as well, this is, allows me now to speak very, very locally in one instance, which is between three family members, and then from there, all of those threads that fed, feed out from there when we all move back to our, to our current places of home. So this, these were the walls of the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Uh, there's also, the, of course, we could we could discuss the the, the, the brutalities and the uh, Australian and Queensland legislation that led to the reason this work exists. The content, know them in correct judgment. The Australian Aboriginal Mission System was established to decimate and to disband and to dislocate Aboriginal communities, families, selves, and cultural practice with the intent to, over generations, have ourselves so dismantled that. There was, no, there was intended to be no Aboriginal self still visible to, to then support the, the, uh, the political kind of regime of Terra Nullius that was imposed upon the continent of Australia. 
but in in terms of we were we were listening before about um, or to to build or to construct a structure, uh, we've inherited narratives and experiences of great trauma and of great cruelty and brutality, but then it comes a point in telling these and, and acting upon these in contemporary practice that how do we involve younger people in them when they're at the point of formation and the point of establishing their selves in the world and we're framing this with through lived experiences of hideous brutality and cruelty which were intentional and, and uh, government sanctioned. So then my family and I started to have all sorts of deep questions around what I and we were doing and so I've come to the point of, of arriving at constructive modes of resistance and constructive modes of resistance in that let's build a narrative for the younger generations in our bigger communities but also in my immediate family. Let's build a, a constructive narrative for them to inherit so that they can have a framework to build their selves on in the future to demonstrate that our Aboriginal selves, our First Nations Indigenous selves are not invisible and not unpresent. So it was a wonderful privilege, it was a real highlight of my life actually. This pictured here are stills from a video that the Art Gallery of New South Wales produced demonstrating that my mum's brother, my, my uncle Milton and his younger son, my, my cousin brother Will Lawton, both supported me in the making of this artwork, telling our grandparents, telling our stories, our shared stories. But the wonderful thing is that through contemporary art practice, we were able to share a male space. And I should, should identify here that in my role in myself and my family, I have uh, a two-spirit identity, that I have a male self and I have a responsibility to support the women in my family in ways that other males in my family might not. So in this instance, uh, we were present as three males across three generations, living and doing ourselves within the institution, actually applying ourselves to the wall of the institution that, uh, that even actually Will and Uncle Milton had not been invited into before. So it's a wonderful privilege to stand on either side of a younger person and his father applying his cultural processes of, of you know, thinking about the, pro let's do this consciously, the same way that we do this out on country, the same way that we do this on sandstone. Uh, connect your physical act of doing and then me on the other side thinking and prompting Will to, to consider the art, the, the sort of the contemporary art context. Where are your hands placed? What's the composition? These kinds of things. So between the three of us, we shared a new living and a new doing of our culture uh, right within the institution and on their own walls. And so the, uh, this particular project allowed me to do what we have been doing for, for, for a very long time. We visited places and locations that we know uh, are, are sites of resource and we accessed the resources through our cultural processes. We then brought them back into our daily lives and here pictures my uncle Milton having fashioned a, a timber um, simile of, of one of our great grandmother's uh, tools of implement. It was a digging stick and a fighting stick and so for us that is a marker of what we know to be a, a significant force and a pushback from, from a women's perspective in my family, a pushback against those forces that sought to uh, literally destroy her sense of self. So my uncle fashioned a what we know as a digging stick but it's also a, f a fighting stick as a weapon and we accessed the ochre and then we brought them into into Sydney uh, maybe 2,000 kilometres from our home territories and on the on the right hand side there we can see Will uh, processing that ochre in a similar way to what might occur in another in another kind of natural environment context so Will was uh, given the responsibility of preparing that ochre knowing it through repetition through doing it's now embedded in his muscle memory. He knows this in himself. And so from this is where the, the, the sort of the community and the interlocking threads come is that Will then goes home to his, his territories and to his local community. And there are other young males within his sort of social and family networks, which then he can share those experiences with. Uh, it's, there's great, what's the word? There's a great... Um, sort of, uh, what's the word, Mar there's, there's a sense of marginalisation in the sense of self in central Queensland that uh, museums and gallery co galleries are not places for Aboriginal people to be, that museums and galleries are not places for Aboriginal people to feel that that is somewhere that they are val valid or that they are recognised or even that they should partake in and contribute to. 
So Will is able to go home and say from a sense of um, authority that this is what I did and this is what we can do in the future. There's a wonderful thing here. This, is, this just demonstrates, in, if we're looking at place and location, you know, we took, we took home to the Art Gallery of New South Wales and on the second day of work on this, on this artwork, Will turned and said in a, in a kind of a little light bulb moment, he said, wow, this looks like home. And sometimes that still actually gets triggered, it sometimes brings me to tears because Will could then see himself and home in the thing that didn't, didn't want, him, want him present. And so we brought home in there and Will brought home into himself in a new way. So then when we do travel out into the bush, those younger ones can, uh, I've, I've hit that, uh, the beauty of that because Will now knows that he, he has something to contribute and he's sharing this among his colleagues. So we, we spend time sitting within the natural environment and, and developing and building our, our expressions into the future. And I'll, I'll, I guess I'll wrap it up, we'll wrap this section up on, it's a, it's a wonderful thing for me to then move beyond uh, Brisbane and Queensland and Australia and to come and to share and to be in dialogue in other places of the world knowing that there are multiple young people who now uh, know that they are present, know that they are present within a visual expression and one of the functions of, of contemporary art practice for us as a, as a network and we're developing this across uh, our social networks at home is that Every time we make an artwork and every time we document one of our processes and our stories, it flies in the face of these other processes which are native title and these other forms of kind of imposed uh, registration and demarcation of, of land, um, land ownership. These, things, these, pr these processes in Australia are, are, are really cruel in that they require all sorts of genetic and social uh, evidence which is actually worked into the system that requires it, that is not actually present for a lot of people. So you're often native title and to have access to understanding self in terms of place in Australia requires you to be able to prove all sorts of lineages which were actually worked out of you, worked out of our, our family networks a long time ago. So we have uh, evidence now, on evidence, we have documentation and, and uh, continued kind of presence through exhibition catalogues, through uh, online presence and through uh, our, our conversations in arts spaces with our artworks. Thank you. Pleasure, pleasure. And, <laughs> and now Naim. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you to Sharjah Art Foundation for bringing us uh, together, the four of us. And I'm really sorry that uh, Zainab Sadira couldn't join us for this panel, but hopefully later in the day. And it's really nice to uh, make connections again, which for me is a way of thinking of community, because I think a few weeks before that July photograph, July 2000, we were together in Germany, and uh, 98 weeks is the first place in Beirut to show United Red Army after Sharjah Biennial, so there's um, some circuits that are being completed uh, or uh, renewed here. Um, I wanted, well, um, I claim or I work in two cities, uh, New York and Dhaka. Dhaka is a city I grew up in and New York is a city I adopted, although I know Tarek will maybe uh, will argue about that term. Um, and I just wanted to spend the time I have here to talk about New York because there are certain formations that I came through or worked my way through, which were community formations. And you'll see a lot of names here, so for anyone interested to research them further, um, each of these names will actually take you down a lot of thread, so please do take pictures, because I won't get a chance to talk about um, everybody on here. Um, but while I was doing this research, I realized that in some ways these uh, community formations 
almost all temporary. Um, none really lasted for all sorts of reasons uh, that we can talk about, but all also had some sort of continuum, not necessarily original family, but adopted family in some ways. Uh, and particularly in New York City, I realized it was the first place I was at where I and we could practice some sort of deterritorialized coming together of midnight three children, India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, um, and of course other um, South Asian countries. But those three were my primary experience of a triangle that could all work together in New York in ways we couldn't um, in our own countries, and still to this day um, can't for various reasons, including of course borders. Um, and I realized when I was looking at this early work that I was involved in that the names that pop up here are the names that still pop up today, but because we've been through so many formations, we don't often remember that we've been working together since the 1990s. We sometimes don't even remember that we're in these things together. Um, so this, I moved to New York in 1994 from Dhaka, and this magazine um, started two years before, uh, and I became involved in 1996. Uh, famously, there was a very strict interview, and I uh, did not answer correctly on the question about Cuba. I was quite critical about Cuba in my interview, so it took a three-month uh, waiting period for me to join. Um, but by 1997, I was fully in the magazine and involved. And there, there's names on here you'll see, um, for example, Kamal Kadir, who back then was an artist, now collects art, um, so he's gone in a different path. But in 1997, it was a struggle to get a South Asian political activist magazine in New York City to publish an artist portfolio in the center. It was considered a bit frivolous, to be frank. Uh, that was the debate we had to have about whether that should be there or whether it diluted the political mission. And that was the first one uh, where we were able to do that. Um, up to, um, you'll see actually here Vijay Prashad. Um, he's the character who shows up in my film that's installed here this many years later. So actually 20 years after this date. Um, but up to 1998 or so, uh, 99, South Asian organizing um, in the cultural sphere was very much about replicating a political history within the New York context, trying to recreate it, and therefore, of course, trying to go into diaspora conditions and trying to talk about what's relevant in this new condition, which often didn't map onto what we were familiar with. Um, and we would teach ourselves to care about issues that we didn't necessarily think about when we were growing up. Um, this was the first magazine where I remember a really long debate for hours and hours about what languages should be on the cover. And every time we would agree on a language, then we'd remember another one we were excluding, which is why you have this design that stretches all the way down. And still there were members of the editorial board who were uh, not satisfied because other languages had been left out. Um, by 2002, this is actually the last issue of the magazine, by 2002, um, it's a dramatic shift, not only this magazine, but also the issues we care about, where now we're very much embedded within the war on terror discourse, and I think it's a moment when that South Asian community is forced into a certain kind of internationalism that was absent in the 1990s in terms of things we're thinking through. Um, and not, not because of that, but it's the last print magazine because it's really, 2002 when people start questioning the value of a printed magazine and whether we should keep doing, um, it's all volunteer magazine, whether we should keep carrying boxes of magazines to venues to try to sell them. So 2002 is both when some of these South Asian magazines go online and also when they start losing their footing because we found out soon after that when we were online, we also somehow didn't have any sort of permanency. And so it's really interesting in the 98 weeks presentation to see magazines from 1952 brought back as uh, objects uh, or research uh, practice materials because in this time somehow, I think we didn't think of archiving and we didn't think of how ephemeral digital would be, uh, which we found out because actually the archives after 2002 are mostly absent because they were all HTML pages uh, which nobody preserved. Uh, so we don't have time so I'll not play this, um, but Okay, a few seconds, yeah. So this is, actually, uh, this is actually a segue from the magazine where an art portfolio was quite contested to music, which was a really crucial presence for us, and uh, this club night called Mutiny, which in the 1990s we didn't necessarily automatically define it as a political space, but it became a place for new community formation, especially where the straight and queer communities commingled in a way we were not necessarily aware of yet, and we certainly didn't think of it as political organizing, but as a grouping that started on the dance floor in 1996 and lasted beyond 
and was, of course, dramatically politicized after 9-11, it led to many other things, which I'll show in a second. Uh, so mutiny led to this, which first was a club night, then became a documentary. It also became a very specific thing, uh, which is that in the 1990s for South Asian Americans, whatever that formation might mean, our source of energy was actually from South, South Asians in Britain. When we're looking for radicalized South Asian formations, we actually couldn't quite find them in our neighboring cities. And so there was an importation from London in some ways to bring in energy, even though um, the names all there are all uh, South Asian American DJs, um, and Mutamasik as a Middle Eastern DJ, and there were some others. Um, and it was a moment where also there was a lot of discomfort with this importation. Um, and I was reminded of it recently when I went to see the Tate show and heard that some of the complaint from black British artists was why the first major uh, black art show at Tate was of an American moment. So these importations bring energy, but also they, are, uh, they can be highly debated. From Mutiny, Asian Underground, uh, we went to this formation, which was Visible Collective, where a group of us who by then either self-defined as artists or simply as organizers or as lawyers, those were the three types, uh, and we formed this new grouping. You'll see some of the same names on there and new names like Uzma Rizvi, who's presenting here uh, in two days, um, who all came together with a very explicit idea that we weren't going to do our organizing in a magazine or on the dance floor, uh, but now we were going to enter the museum. And this is actually, for me and a few others, this was the beginning of making work uh, for the museum, specifically around post 9-11 uh, racial panic, or security panic rather, and we started making work for the museum. It lasted till 2006, maybe later I'll talk about why we ended, similar uh, reasons in some ways. Um, and all of that converged into this show in 2005, which I always think is very important and I still haven't found someone to do the research because what to me is interesting is there were 22 artists in the show. It was the first time that most of us were in a group show where we're identified within the category South Asian American, even though there were Canadians there, even though there were people without even green cards, even though there were people there who had been in New York for two years. And so what that quote unquote American identity meant, whether we were ready to be in it, was very uncomfortable and disputed. But at the same time, 2004, 2005, we all felt a political reason to identify within this American identity precisely to take apart the idea of America that was, you know, this is deep in the middle of the Gulf War, um, the two wars. Um, and one of the things I think about is that there are some people on here, there'll be familiar names to you, um, of course, including Shazia, um, who's shown here, Chitra, et cetera, who have continued to make work. And I think a lot about those who don't make work anymore or those who I don't see within these contexts or other contexts, and I think about why. Um, why people don't appear is um, something I think about often. Uh, but it was, it was a turning point for many of us because certainly for many of us at this point, we would still describe New York as a city that we maybe work in, but live isn't a word we many of us used yet, and we started to at this point. Um, I'll just quickly end with this thing, which is that what I find now interesting 10 years later is I realize now that many of the comrades on the dance floor were also in graduate school at the time, which sometimes is a way you have a lot of time on your hands. And I realize that people such as Falu, who I would meet and who would say, oh yeah, I'm also doing research about this scene. And I would say, oh, um, it puzzled me. Until 10 years later, she came out with her book, um, Ad did others, Vivek Bald, who was the DJ, who then went on to write this very influential book, Bengali Harlem, which is now being made into a film. Um, so Jenny Reddy, who was part of that group, who brought out Nursing and Empire. And each of these books, although they seem to be very different tentacles, when I look back on them today, I can see that we were having conversations about this even in the 90s. So Jenny was actually part of the group that decided to end print and start online. Um, and we were on two sides of that uh, argument. But somewhere in 1996 or 98, she was already think, working on this book also in ways that were invisible. Uh, and this was a group of them together did this book, The Sun Never Sets, which again has Vijay Prashad, who's kind of an older figure within this community by now. Um, that's Vijay installed here in Sharjah. And I just want to end with uh, this chart, and I hope I can just click on it to go online. This is a somewhat disputed chart I presented last year at the Queen's Museum, um, where I was trying to um, 
track these networks? Because I was trying to figure out where did we all come from and who did we work with in all this time? And of course, the moment I showed it on stage, uh, the first thing that happened is someone put up their hand and you said, you've forgotten this group. <laughs> Uh, and it turned out I'd forgotten many groups, of course. Um, so it's a still work in progress, but what I like about it is, for example, Saucy, which is South Asian Women's Creative Collective, you can see that this node is very large because all of us were connected in various ways. Then South Asian Lesbian Gay Association is a smaller node. Fatal Love, which is the show, is a very big node. Uh, let me close that. Uh, then, of course, New York is kind of an obnoxiously large node. Um, Sun Never Sets, the anthology, still a work in progress. Um, there's Uzma right there. Um, you can see she's connected to many things. Uh, and we have, uh, well, we're, we're updating this right now because of course the first reaction was the Canadian contingency was underrepresented. Um, south of the border was underrepresented as, um, as was Europe obviously within this. Um, but what was interesting is to see how long we had been all working together without tracing that as a continuous thing. And I thought about this a lot because there was an event last year in New York where Vivek Bald presented his mutiny film again, 15th anniversary screening, along with a concert by the Kominas, which is a Muslim punk band. And most of the audience was there for the Kominas. And what was, what was, what was expected but also disconcerting was how much of that Kominas audience had never heard of mutiny. And that's only a 10 year gap. Um, and so that I think about a lot about, you know, I mean, it's not the same impulse as the archiving impulse, but I feel that in many of these cities, there's such an emphasis on the new that the connections are actually being rubbed away because it almost seems like everyone wants to be reborn. Um, and certainly the way artists are presented is always about almost coming sui generis without a linkage. And so I'm interested in tracing these linkages. Right. Can you continue about Dhaka a bit, about what oh, sure. your engagement in Dhaka? I changed the so it's oh, okay. good to, <laughs> uh, to continue. Um, yeah, sure. Um, actually, I can just quickly go to... Um, so uh, when you moved to New York, uh, did you move from London? No, from You Dhaka. moved from Dhaka, okay. I, Yeah, that's a biography confusion. I was born in London, but okay, we but left you, when I was Okay, but you moved two. from Dhaka, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can just quickly go to this, just so we have an image. Um, Dhaka, I'll just say very quickly. Um, Dhaka, I've always worked with networks created by my friends. I've not created those networks myself. So I worked with Drik, which then led to Chobi Mela, uh, these are, it's a photography collective, many people here know them. Then I work with uh, young people within Chobi Maladrik who went into Bengal Foundation. Uh, I w we co-founded a blog, Alaludulal. I think there the, the factor was very different. Um, the thing that would, that brought us apart were a very specific political um, contingency, which yesterday when talking to Marwa about Arab Spring in some ways, I thought about that as well which is that at a certain point when we, having worked together within a secular, progressive, left coalition for a long time and sort of sharing the comfort of knowing that you know where everybody stands, quote unquote, but also, I mean, I think you get a little complacent when you think everybody is from the same contingency. And when we finally face a situation where the Islamist possibility, which we had talked about for 20 years, but truly never faced on the streets in that way, when it finally arrives and we find that actually they are able to bring in a much larger number of people onto the streets, which then becomes a question of street politics, which I think in some ways we did in a sort of rehearsal way, but never in a real way. When facing that situation, the first thing that happened to us even after working for 20 years is we kind of started turning on each other. So it's what we talked about yesterday as kind of a civil war within the left. Um, and I don't want to at all be on a pessimistic note, but I think this I've seen as a commonality between Dhaka and New York, which is that what gets in the way of community is the narcissism of small differences. And the demands of purity of position sometimes seem to be asked of our comrades much more than others. So um, I, that wasn't the answer to your question, but that's kind of on my mind yeah. because we've been wondering how this moment and these energies um, have I actually stopped. asked you about London because I, I would like also to know, because you arrived in New York, these groups were already, wor some of them were already working, right? Mm -hmm. So you joined. Right. But while you were in Dakar, were you also involved with groups before moving to New York? Or it was not During, that. Um, I co-founded this group, a group called Alalo Dulal, yes. uh, which is an activist collective group. Yep. Um, 
which was preceded by another group. Activist slash artist, or activist and artist. Uh, we just said writing collective, actually. Okay. Um, yeah, we didn't define ourselves um, yeah. in terms of what we worked on per se, but th this is actually a collective that I wish had lasted, and this is, I think, the one where we at a certain point couldn't get past our differences of strategy. And um, just so it's not a mystery, the big debate within the secular progressive groups was, what's your approach to uh, the Islamist possibility? Do you, are you going to be completely opposed or are you going to figure out some way of dialogue? And we were sharply split between those of us. I mean, I included where I said, you need to be in dialogue because you're never going to be, you're never going to overrun in a, I mean, it's also a very particular history of the left there, where the left through the 70s saw religion as, you know, the opium of the people that can be bypassed. And by the 2000s, we understand that that's not the condition we are in. We are all influenced by all the work coming out, including, you know, Sabah Mahmood, who's just passed away. Very influential in the Bangladesh context of, you know, how you engage with piety. Um, and within arts context, I've often seen we have a very ambivalent relationship with piety, and we don't know how to engage with it, except in a politics that, at least in the Asian context, was handed over to us from the 70s, which is direct conflict yeah. and not dialogue. Yeah. And uh, would you speak a bit about the, the, how engaging with all these kind of groups and communities informed your work, affected your work, influenced your work, your artistic work? People, of course, are able to see some of your, uh, one, one piece of yours today, yeah during the March meeting in, one, in uh, which, which is the, what is the venue? It, uh, it's Baitul um, Gulum Ibrahim. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and after Maghrib, so 6.55 onwards. Yeah. Um, if you can just give an idea or, you know. So I would say maybe the um, easiest way to talk about it without making too conscious something that works better when it's subconscious for myself is that all the communities I've been involved in, in New York and Dhaka, you know, I, n I don't think of them as a way to make work. Uh, I mean, I don't know what that word actually m means. I mean, I don't know what the differentiation I'm making between, let's say, work in the gallery and work on the blog and work in the magazine. Maybe it's all work, but of course, the work in the museum space has much more visibility than the other works, and maybe it, there's ways that it's preserved. Versus, as I said, the magazine is now, there are no copies left. I feel that when, when I've worked through these formations, when we all work through these formations, we're having these conversations that end up, without us realizing it, being the notebooks for the project. But we're not thinking about it at the time. Like Vivek Bulb, when he was a DJ, his primary identity was as a musician. Somewhere in there was a conversation about why the South Asian scene was primarily driven by energy from not only British Asian, but also African American music. Somewhere within that conversation, Vivek Bald went down the path of finding out that the first Asian Bengali migrants to the US in the 1890s, 1900s married into African American communities because they couldn't bring their wives over. Somewhere in there, he decided when the music scene ended that he was going to apply to a PhD. S Seven years later, he comes out with the book. But 10 years ago, if you had said, you know, I mean, it's one among many conversations he was having, not really on the dance floor, but in the cigarette break between music. Um, so I feel like for me, it's also that. I've never, I've never been able to look at one of these things and say, uh, oh, this is, you know, Ananta Jalil, like somebody like him is going to show up in my work. But I feel like he will, um, because it's constantly secret, and I think it works better um, so Vijay, in a way, was this figure that was always with us in the New York scene, and also uh, very important, one of the first South Asian academics who started really talking about Asian black linkages in the 90s when not very many people were working about that. Now a lot of people are. Um, 15 years later, you come back to him and you say, I'm going to Algeria, do you want to come with us, right? And he actually went to Algeria originally just to be with, and then became the protagonist as things developed. So, process of accident, I think. Okay, great. And uh, from here, I would move a bit to ask you all about the conditions around your artistic practice, in a way, the political uh, conditions and also the social conditions, challenges, obstacles that you are facing while you are working on this. I would uh, start with Marwa, maybe. And if you tell us a bit about uh, your work right now, you have your academic work, but also you have your artistic work, and you are very interested at the moment in the 
Kurdish women movement. Um, can you tell us a bit about that research and how are you engaging with them, uh, specifically uh, in this case that you are engaging with communities that are in a war zone, basically, right? And uh, so if you tell us a bit about it. Um, yeah, well, uh, this also started actually with uh, 98 weeks, the um, work with the autonomous women's movement. Uh, it's, I mean, they were, they came to Beirut and we had a reading group uh, of uh, a text by a guerrilla woman uh, talking about the ecological uh, paradigm within the um, uh, within the autonomous women's movement, uh, and uh, so th it started with this uh, uh, text and this uh, reading uh, reading group and the text by Pelshin, and uh, then we were again invited uh, uh, Dima Ahmed and I to go uh, and visit them and you know understand better what uh, the movement was about. Um, and this is how our engagement, um, but uh, yeah, I just, um, I think that now what shifted from the work was uh, 98 weeks that is, uh, you know, that was at some point uh, really uh, closed within this, uh, let's say, knowledge production group. Um, uh, in 2015, when the uh, a protest, uh, when there was a garbage, I mean, the garbage crisis is still, going on but when there was like the uh, uh, you know uh, the the garbage crisis was uh, really like uh, you know at its peak in uh, in uh, the summer of 2015 in Beirut uh, we formed the uh, together with other feminist organization the feminist block and we were really working uh, uh, you know uh, trying to be uh, uh, trying to have a, uh, a a place within the protests that are addressing, uh, you know, uh, issues of uh, structural issues uh, of gender, etc. So this is the moment when the feminism's research project of 98 weeks really connected with uh, organizations that were working on women's rights and you know m much more on the ground on legalities, etc. And organizations that were uh, much more, uh, uh, you know, involved in, uh, let's say, political, uh, direct political action. And uh, my question at the beginning, in regards to how this uh, knowledge production can actually go, can, um, you know, start forming a powerful uh, discourse and be translated into political praxis. This was really the moment when this happened in the summer of 2015, or at least we saw it concretely happen in. Uh, uh, you know, by taking part and connecting with all these different organizations and taking part in the feminist bloc. Uh, right after that, the we had the uh, we invited the, the autonomous women's movement, and I think the reading group around uh, the, the text by Pelshin, who's a guerrilla fighter, uh, and the reading group around this text was really uh, uh, and the thinking about the ecological paradigm of the autonomous women's movement really came from this. Uh, ecological catastrophe that was happening uh, at that moment in Beirut, and so, uh, and, and so we were invited to um, Dima Ahmed and I were invited to go and visit them and understand better what, uh, you know, how these um, let's say uh, um, ideologues of the party are working and uh, sort of developing all of these uh, different political paradigms. Uh, and how these paradigms are actually practiced. Uh, so w we went there and we spent, uh, uh, you know, uh, some time uh, with them and, uh, you know, meeting a lot of the people that are um, sort of like, uh, a lot of the women that were um, sort of like thinking and uh, writing and developing these ideas. Um, and so uh, this is the, um, the, this was like the the moment where uh, I guess like the mm, work shifted more into uh, looking at political, directly political group and their ways of how they're structured, how they're working, how these, uh, you know, uh, ideas are being developed, how the uh, reading groups in these kind of contexts are taking place and looking also at the knowledge production within a political party and how this uh, ideologies are being, uh, you know, formed and developed and practiced as well. So I think the really particular thing about the autonomous women's movement is really this 
uh, you know, uh, the uh, of course, like the very strong. I mean, they've been working for 40 years, so this is um, also like a long time. And um, yeah, Kurdistan so across yes. uh, Kurdistan yes. in Iraq and Syria, yes. but within the this the latest <laughs> political and uh, the war actually in Iraq and Syria and the uh, rise of the Islamic State, they they started also to work and start to be visible also, no? Yes, of yeah. course, because this is when the political uh, alliances shifted and this is, yeah, I think this is like a, a different uh, subject. It's very related to their presence, but I think what we were really, you know, going um, uh, and really like, uh, you know, working with them on this whole like, uh, um, you know, development of uh, the uh, feminist and eco-feminist uh, paradigm that they have. So, yeah, this is the... And maybe we go also a bit um, to talk with Naim about the differences between the local networks and the global networks, I would say. I would, uh, and you are always using also the term Global South that you didn't mention now today in your presentation, but it's written in many uh, of the publications that you that present you and your work, etc. And I would like also to challenge this term a bit in our discussion now when you speak about the local and the global uh, networks. Uh, is it a valid term? Is it uh, can you challenge it and think about it differently? Uh, is there a real line between the north, uh, what, what we can call then north, global north and global south? And uh, yeah, so if you can tell us a bit about that. And if I can connect it a little bit with... Um, uh, I, uh, not necessarily, of course um, you can. I just wanted of course to you can, jump on something that uh, Maro had said. If I understood you correctly, you had said that you're looking for a way for the feminist bloc to make a space within, and, and I'm really interested in thinking together with you and everybody here, how we can get into a paradigm where feminist blocs don't make space but take over the space. Uh, because in Bangladesh also, I mean, I didn't explain but the Shahbag movement, which was our failed uh, Arab Spring moment, had a similar discourse where the feminist books found a small space and the queer movement found an even smaller space. And there's a famous feminist leader from previous generation who said, well, the feminist movement in Bangladesh is always the salt at the end of the meal, um, which you always add on, but it's always, you know, and I'm really interested in thinking of how it can take over rather than make space, just my instant reaction. And then I think connecting with Dale also, when we last saw each other in Germany, we were having a very intense conversation partially about your return to Australia because that was a moment where you were also talking about what it meant to be in, of course, a nurturing environment in Germany, where you were suddenly, we were all suddenly within this parliament of bodies, as right, Paul Preciado right. called it, but you were also going to go back to your local situation. Um, and I think, I think there was a way that that was creating a crisis that seemed very familiar to me also. Right. I don't know if you want to jump in and I can also then <laughs> circumnavigate I'll around I'll you. Okay, okay, yeah, sure, 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 yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll do a little like interjection. I mean, I think um, oh, I use the term Global South as a term of power. Um, as, you know, as Two Meetings talks about and as Vijay reminds us, there was a time when the term Third World was a project, not a place, and it was definitely a term of power. And 1973, in a way, is a peak moment where it really seems like the Third World project, whether it's non-aligned movement or post-Bandung or movement for Afro-American unity, uh, Afro-Asian unity is going to replace the global north broadly understood as North America, Europe, etc. cetera. Um, and then that starts coming apart because that terminology already has problems within it because it's not economy-based because within the third world project were also countries of the Middle East. There were countries that were oil rich at the same table as countries that were maybe resource starved and you're all trying to be together and figure out what is your commonality. And I think, you know, post 80s, third world becomes a term of dispossession and also connected to the aid crisis. And as I understand it, the people that I work with, Global South came about also as a way to link movements in, I hate this term, but the non-West, um, movements of alliance that are also connected to uh, the, m the movements within North American Europe that are the internal communities that don't fit within this. I mean, it's a little bit of connected to Herbert Marcuse's theory, a little bit of one-dimensional man of where there's numb 
populations and when there's activated populations, although we know that that all also constantly changes. So I've always thought of Global South as a way to make new connections that sometimes, of course not always, will try to make a thread between communities where you know, actually class differences are too large for us to organize. I mean, what is the commonality between, let's say, myself or any of us and the large South Asian population that works here? Perhaps terms such as the Global South becomes a way to do commonality while also not papering over the differences, right? Which, for example, most clearly manifest at borders, if nothing else. Um, and it's, it's an imperfect term, for sure. Uh, but I prefer it, for example, to like non-West as a definition, but because also we're talking about communities that are yeah. all, you know, nobody's just located in one location anymore yeah. also. Yeah, but does uh, using this term exclude uh, movements like the Occupy Wall Street movement as a kind of uh, movement of, with inspiration? Would it uh, also, uh, I'm very sorry that Zainab is not here, but like uh, I remember, I can tell you, uh, uh, a story when I was uh, once I was in Marseille and uh, and Zainab had uh, an exhibition in a city close by, and they had to to remove two uh, pieces that I think they are shown here in the uh, in the show anyways. And then there was a big discussion in Marseille between intellectuals and artists and how this uh, can happen. Actually, the piece uh, it was about a discussion between her and her mother about the collaborator or the people who work with the French, etc. And at that moment, that region was controlled politically by uh, right, uh, far right uh, French, etc. So, and I considered that also that this, that, this, that kind of discussion was also uh, an important, although it's, it's happening in a geographical territories that cannot be defined as, you know, uh, global uh, south, and also Zainab is not considered, you know what I mean? Uh, living in that geographical uh, territories, although she is engaged with, or for example, the connections between different women, uh, feminist groups that uh, worked a lot on the Afghanistan uh, situation, or even with the Kurdish, etc. So I, I, I try to think, maybe we can also open the, uh, that for the, with the audience to make suggestions about what kind of terms can be used uh, uh, in a way, you know, in the future, or yeah. I mean, can challenge it, not, not, to, not to be against it, mm -hmm. I'm not against, uh, in, uh, but I'm trying to challenge it and to think differently, etc. I mean, I don't think we'll solve the terminology question tonight, although maybe a manifesto will come Absolutely out at the end. Not. But I just want to say one thing, because you mentioned Occupy Wall Street, yeah. because I was also involved in that yeah. movement. Uh, it was a very specific moment when Occupy Wall Street had raised enough money to make budget decisions, and one of the first budget decisions they made, Marwan knows this very well, was to send a delegation to Tahrir Square. And it was a classic moment of, actually, no, you don't have the training to do anything in Tahrir Square. You will actually be a liability, which they were, um, you'll stand out, you'll endanger the people around you, mm -hmm. but you are doing it in this sort of global solidarity move, which I've also made films about people who do that kind of motion, but romanticizing that and actually implementing it. So I think part of it is, I mean, I'm not trying to put Occupy Wall Street and I'm not trying to do any sort of equivalency, uh, but, I think, but I think there's uh, an assumption that yeah, Occupy sorry, Wall Street is something to teach. Here. The, the Occupy Wall Street followed. Tahrir right, but Occupy, sent, but Occupy sent delegates because they said they wanted to observe what was going Tahrir, on. The but this, but, but, but the Tahrir. idea yeah. that, they, that there are some sort of like UN, I mean these are mm. people who, for many of them it's their first level of organizing, yeah. and the idea that they're going to go from America and go to Egypt as observers, to me I felt was a tremendous misunderstanding of what your situation is and what your strengths are. You know, like a missionary project I'm sorry, I was very critical of that. I'm, I'm sorry, but I, 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 there is also because this is a really uh, misunderstanding that everybody talk about it as if Tahrir Square followed no, no, in time. No, no, that's not the what Occupy I said. Wall Street. The, the opposite happened, huh? And this is something we have to acknowledge and to th think about. I'm sorry for that. But maybe then <laughs> you can you can tell us a bit about your discussion in Documenta, and also I would like Dale, yeah, to tell us a bit about also the. The, um, uh, the reaction, uh, or reaction, the diverse reactions in Documenta about your, your, your piece. And maybe you can also tell us uh, if you got any inappropriate uh, reaction that you felt hurt about or something. Sure. And uh, because of course, 
this kind of uh, practice that can be very sensitive also to, you know, to uh, misre misreading the work and right. thinking about it, uh, right. etc. Misleading the work, misleading people, communities, and then forming, you know, forming and perpetuating pedagogies that that are already in place, and then just strengthen and get take on a new form and another new, new little kind of parasitic root into another form of who we are. Um, well, maybe I could uh, I could jump in by saying uh, I've started using blue as a pigment in exactly the same process as all these kind of things. And one of the privileges I have being here now is to get to further our, our artistic practice, right? And so using blue, I was in front of an artwork in Queensland, actually, in, in Australia. And this is a very significant um, uh, senior painter, history painter, who was documenting the stories of massacre on the same territory that I, I have connection to. And I was studying this, this work by old man Vincent Serico and, and looking at how this applies to myself and our stories. And two, two v viewers came in front of the work and myself, between myself and the work, and I heard them talking and judging and describing that this can't possibly be a work by an Aboriginal person because they use blue and green. Insisting inside that, that statement, insisting that uh, he must only, and that by extension I must only, and that all of us must only use uh, the, the pigments that these pe particular people are familiar with, which is what was taught to them by the Australian education system, which of course is framed by all of those, those other mechanisms. Uh, and then so um, making the same blue work now, which was, this was inspired the, the work that came into, in, into Documenter at Castle, and that um, presenting the work as myself and presenting the work in, as, as a kind of a, a, a window into who we might be, um, I've, I've been questioned quite directly. And I, I guess when you ask, was I hurt by responses? I don't get hurt, I just get probably more disappointed that people can't move beyond what they've been, what they've been conditioned yeah. to believe, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's personally, it doesn't hurt me, but I, I can see that they've, that they've got some work to do and maybe they're not listening. Um, and so, uh, there was a particular response by a, 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 a person who saw the work and kept asking me, so what did the Aborigines, yada, 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 what did the Aborigines, how did the Aborigines, and on three occasions myself and the chorus, the documenter chorus, described that actually no, hang on, you're speaking to Dale right now in front of his work right now, which is all what you're framing in a context prior to colonisation by the British Empire. So he just kept constantly referring to the Aborigines as if I was already dead and that as if my entire story was already dead, but yet he was consuming the product of it via contemporary art. And so, which is of course a very museological and, and, and an even a, an anthropological context that he wasn't looking at me now as someone with something to contribute, he was looking at it via his history book, his history book learning. Okay. Naim, would you like to add something about your discussions in Documenta when you were in two minutes? And then we open the... Very <laughs> good. I mean, I think that was very much about, I mean, no matter what solidarity and situation we create, we also understood that work originating from a specific context was being shown in Athens and Castle in a very different context. Right completely out of the context also. And then the body of the artist is representing the work and the situation and the geography. And then there was a very specific decision of not having labels initially. So that actually confounds the audience because they can't figure out where this person is from. And then right. also this obsession to figure out where this person is from. And so I think the conversation we were having were, I mean, I think specifically what I was talking to Dale about is where he's, where he was flying back to a really long flight, which is why we started talking about it, yeah. is going to be at least temporarily removed from that situation yeah. until you come back to a place like Sharjah or somewhere else where you're being brought back into this discussion. And I think what we're talking about is what happens when you go back having represented, but of yeah. course having been dissatisfied with the representation, not only just for that experience, but in all sorts of other ways, sure. trying to collapse that much local situation into this bullet, you know, very brief, is very frustrating. So I think, I mean, I don't want to talk about it from the place of lack or want right. or actually even lament, but what there's a way that you definitely feel like you're 
brain, your consciousness is getting split when you're doing this back and forth, and you're going back to the source of, I mean, the source of strength was a language that you use very specifically, which I can't necessarily use, because Dhaka and New York are not the same. Right. They're, maybe they turn some motor on, but they don't, they're not that renewal dynamic. Our situations are very different. Um, yeah. So I don't know, that's a really convoluted, uh, I don't know, maybe Dale can make sense sure. of what uh, I just said. <laughs> well, I, I guess uh, in included in all of that, oh, and it's, it's, it's a very problematic thing, but I, I, hope, I hope we all understand why. But in terms of looking at bodies, um, as we can be uh, in the environment uh, in, in on Garingbo country at Carnarvon Gorge and describing to people uh, the, re the reasons why that landscape is, has taken the form in terms of visual practice and, and cultural continuum, the reason it's taken those forms now. Uh, when I'm speaking to, and particularly Will Lawton, who was, who was pictured before working with us in Sydney, uh, there are all sorts of qualifications and even, what do we call those kind of degradations on, on the val validity of our, of our pers perspectives and the, the validity of, of, of our contributions based on what we look like. Uh, and and, and that names, space. that's what we talked about. That's right, that of course. For the Australian right. artists, sometimes the names wouldn't right. give people the clue. So Certainly. they would hear Dale Harding and not make the connection. Certainly. In the way they can with Marwa and my name, for example. Certainly. And even in that, uh, uh, right now, we, we, I mean, we have, again, the privilege of right at this moment deciding the future of... Uh, so my father is a wonderful man, and my father is a, is a significant component, component sig significant contributor in our cultural networks. And my father's not a, an Aboriginal man, and that doesn't discount my father from his great standing and respect and, and, and the reverence that he and my mum hold together as senior people in our community. So this is right at this very moment, a discussion that we're, we're, we're chewing on is that, um, uh, you know, um, the last name, Harding, comes from my father. A wonderful man, deeply respected among our community. And is he any less of a, an elder within our, within our networks and then in relation to the place that we draw our work from? It's incredibly complex. I don't have answers for it, but in no way do we consider that even... Um, our other family members who are, uh, don't have an Aboriginal lineage, that's even ugly, but uh, 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 that they're not valid or not recognised because what we all bring together when we get together as a family unit is one new culture, is one new contribution beyond kind of the, the, the other delineations, which is why I didn't put that on the map so much. Uh, I would like to uh, react a bit to what you said that we cannot really untangle the, the or redefine the terms uh, and I would like to close with that, huh? to, so, and we open the, the floor for uh, questions, uh, because actually if, in case you make, you Google, you make a search on art communities, none of what you said is there. There's a very diverse uh, definition and specification, but none of what you have told us today is kind of, uh, uh, can fall under these definitions or descriptions. And this is what I, w I wanted really to show during this panel, that the, the practices are very diverse and the way that you work also are very diverse. And I think it opens lots of questions and, uh, and uh, I'm sure the audience wonder and have some questions. And uh, so we'll have like 10 minutes of uh, questions to any of the panelists. And, uh, Can I add one thing about uh, Zainab Sidira in, uh, in Marseille? It was the same week when Leila Shahid was, uh, her lecture about Jean Genie was canceled. So it was not the whole discussion and discourse in Marseille at that moment was not only about Zainab because she is Algeri originally Alge Algerian or whatever, it was Zainab and Jean Genie whom somebody dared to censorship a lecture about his, uh, his work. May I? Um, one, I like Global South. Um, I think it has a very useful, do I have to stand the whole time I ask my question? Thank you. Um, I think that what to me, uh, this conversation is a really productive one. Um, there are several of us who started off in the South Asian 
New York contemporary art and whatever identity lost world and have ended up in the Middle East art world and there is a lot of connective tissue and there's a lot of uh, not only geographical aspects that collapse, but temporal. I always go back to the fact that Fez was in Beirut, that Rashida Ryan has played a really important role in connecting all of these. What next steps can we come up with with this rich conversation that you just had that will help these different communities uh, gain from each other? as a kind of potential global south that has common issues. And I wanna ask this in a very specific way. What is productive and unproductive about the fact that most of being in New York and using diaspora as a means for creating sometimes uncomfortable and false community, as a Pakistani, as a part of the South Asian community, I was always a little bit uncomfortable. Um, then with the Middle East uh, arts community, I'm Muslim and I've probably spent more time in the Middle East as a child than I have in Pakistan, but don't quite belong there. And the Middle East is an expansive geography that there are parts that never fully fit also. So how do we use the diaspora lens as a strength rather than a weakness? Because it does have problems. And I mean, Arab Theater Fund, did you feel that there was usefulness in that as well as weaknesses? Mm -hmm. Just a few questions, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Anybody who would like to respond to the... Uh, would you like to respond, any of you? I would, I would uh, I, I'm, still, I'm still not comfortable at all uh, with the term Global South, or I, I would like to challenge it not to take it as a kind of uh, matter of fact, because also the, the way it's perceived as if like the, it's a kind of the third world, I mean, it's kind of, uh, uh, can we imagine a situation? Let's imagine that I am in Marseille while Zainab had the cancellation of the, or not cancellation of the show, but like two pieces were taken out. And at the same time, the lecture about Jean Genet is canceled. Shall I, uh, have a, dis a discussion with all my friends and intellectuals and uh, artists, etc., only about uh, about uh, Zainab or Zainab and Jean Genie. You know, does it does it make a difference? Global you know South, I mean? but Global South yeah, doesn't it mean makes a exclusion. Difference? Why? Ah. But Global South doesn't mean exclusion of Jean Genie from that story, and it's not necessarily geographically. The term itself also. excludes because you're thinking of it geographically only. Yeah, 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 well, I'm, I mean, I don't agree, but I mean, I, I accept. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. Can, I, can I just quickly say that Global South is about a perspective rather than like a territory, exactly, yeah. if, that, if you agree with that. That's how I see it. So, yeah, so it doesn't great, obviously yeah. Yeah, exclude Jean Genet. Western Europe and so on and so on. Occupy Wall Street. Uh, What's that? Exactly, that too. So it's not a perfect term as we have mentioned, but it's something we've got now and it can definitely change and I think it will change. So. Yeah. I don't have a suggestion yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah. So. No, no, but what you said as a look at it as a perspective, that's really a nice, yeah, that's really a Alec. Um, thank you very much. There's a quote, a quote by Fa Dr. Faisal Darraj, the um, Palestinian philosopher, who says like uh, he, he also sees this problem of belonging to a place and being called a Palestinian. So he writes that um, belonging to a cause basically makes you a Palestinian, belonging to the cause or kind of like being part of it, whether geographically or not. Um, it would also entitle you the, t the name Palestinian, but that's not my question. <laughs> 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 my question is to Marwa, can you give us an example of the feminist uh, paradigms that you've been researching or you've been coming across with your work uh, with the Kurdish movements and other? 
Um, yeah. Uh, actually, so the mm, purpose was to create this uh, sort of uh, pot of uh, knowledge of uh, different feminist uh, traditions and see how these intersect and also how these can, as I said before, be um, thought through in order to think about like, um, uh, you know, um, how they can be uh, sort of like translated into praxis. And um, so uh, we had different um, reading groups and one of them was um, Islamic feminism, which is a uh, sort of a reformist uh, um, tradition that works with sharia and uh, uh, re-interpretation uh, of uh, Islamic laws. Um, um, I mean, it's uh, quite contested within like, um, let's say secular feminists and um, sometimes they're um, not accepted or uh, not even like um, allowed to be called themselves feminist as uh, from the perspective of the, you know, like secular feminist. And um, um, I think, uh, this was actually quite a productive uh, reading group that we had because we also uh, at the same time invited uh, some people working in civil law um, and uh, had a um, in intense conversation there. Uh, f uh, uh, Islamic feminists mainly um, working within like uh, Northern African context. So there's a lot of uh, knowledge production in the Maghreb or in uh, Iran as well. Um, and um, and now a little bit more in uh, Lebanon was in the Shia uh, community, so there is some uh, uh, Islamic, uh, I mean, yeah, some uh, uh, yeah Islamic feminists or people that working within the Islamic legality within the uh, Shia community to reinterpret the laws that are uh, you know in regards to heritage, in regards to uh, marriage, divorce, uh, you know, children's. Uh, um, I would say like, uh, yeah, Hadan, uh, yeah, family laws, etc. Um, I think that, uh, um, yeah, I mean, we were really interested in these reformist um, uh, traditions as well because, um, yeah, they are also like um, on thinking of thinking about them on a, a practical and pragmatic uh, level. They have been like doing. Uh, a lot of uh, great work because, you know, also like a lot of um, women within, for example, the Shia community or the Sunni community um, in Lebanon, they're uh, not identifying with the secular laws and they really want to follow the... Uh, the main clash uh, was that, um, and this came out a lot in our discussions, that the Islamic feminists, of course, do not um, say that the the Nos the text the Quran the Quranic text is in itself patriarchal. They accept it as it is and then work from there. And of course, this is not a possibility for uh, you know secular feminists or like other let's say groups of feminists. And this was uh, um, and so we also had of course like a lot of um, you know queer feminists and uh, postcolonial feminist readings and. Uh, um, also, uh, yeah, a lot from the Kurdish Autonomous Women's Movement, um, uh, as well as, uh, um, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, as Maybe uh, you can like tell Marxist us feminists, uh, like uh, Italian traditions, so Silvia Federici, and a bit about the ecofeminism, like uh, what you did here also two years ago, and also in relationship to the Kurdish. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is really important in the context of Beirut also now. Um, within the uh, Kurdish women's movement, it's uh, um, really interesting how they are dealing with agriculture, farming and land, uh, and uh, forming cooperatives also uh, um, in some autonomous women's villages in the north uh, of Syria. Uh, this is, of course, like a very precarious uh, situation because of what is happening now in Afrin and uh, we don't know what will, you know, uh, come out of this uh, uh, project, but at least I think they have, uh, I mean, maybe what could, um, and what we hope for from the Rojava project, what could come out or like what could be um, something that is uh, on the long term influential to the wider social, uh, uh, you know, uh, fabric is really this uh, ecofeminist uh, paradigm. So the ecological and the autonomous movement uh, in, in terms of how, what work they have done 
uh, with uh, let's say uh, yeah like um, with the, with the with the woman within like the uh, this uh, sort of like the traditional uh, uh, social context so yeah it's a precarious project of course because of the war and what is happening now but hopefully this will sort have a lot of influences last question hello uh, what if i'm f uh, feeling that whole idea for the struggle of identity it seems that identity is a very comfort shelter it gives a gives kind of a comfort shelter but recently what we are seeing in us and many places where identities are imposed or identities identities are dragged out um, from the human being like suppose when a uh, white person kill a lot of kids in a school they take out the identity and they say oh he is a psycho but when a black or a muslim kills then the whole identity of the community imposes on that uh, on that uh, being on, the, on that individual so I, I my question is for naim when you are associating uh, with the south asian identity or the bangladeshi or the muslim have you ever it's a personal question because um, i what i am curious to know that or maybe to you uh, that have you ever find any discomfort uh, with that identity which you are associating continuously or working with or dealing with? Are there sen any situations like that? I, oh, uh, yeah, certainly. In the erasure of those, if I assert myself in my cultural lineages as a Bidra man, then, then I have to be conscious not to silence or erase those other family members, those others in my community who are not um, visible in that, you know. Uh, my, my family, through the brutalities of the Queensland government and the Department of Native Affairs, we have Torres Strait, South Sea, Aboriginal, Aboriginal from all over Australia, and m many, many other non-Aboriginal being um, British, coloni British, uh, well, British colo colonist pastoralists. We have, um, in our family networks, we have people from all over. Basically what I'm trying to say is that I'm always conscious not to uh, erase or, or overlay enough of myself that, that doesn't make visible all of the other parts of who we are as a, as a larger network. Uh, and I didn't get to it in, in, in the, uh, the slide before, but the other image was of my, my younger sister, Marika, and, and the wonderful thing was Marika spending time in the, the Queensland Art Gallery that day seeing, knowing and, and recognising that all of her narratives are, well many of her narratives are visible in current exhibitions. Then the next day we went again and she brought one of her sisters, which is another community, members, community member and Marika was then able to share again through another lineage um, her sense of self with another South Sea Island me family member. So um, we're, we're very complex and it's, it's a challenge for us to uh, maintain our connection to place and to cultural inheritance, but also not to erase anyone else. Um, I prefer positionality and subjectivity <coughs> rather than identity because it gives me more space to move around. Um, I think the one thing I will say, and maybe for people working in an arts context, things are sharper and quicker because we're some sort of canaries in the coal mine uh, or we project things earlier. I think especially last 30 years, I've experienced that our positionality is constantly changing. It's very difficult to keep it fixed. And the thing that I've experienced most clearly, and which is actually why I put up Samar magazine from the 90s, in the 90s we didn't talk in terms of religion at all. Um, in fact, our unification process was that religion was left outside and you tried to have this, I think you said temporary um, South Asian commonality. And after 2001, for all sorts of reasons, our Muslim identity came front. <laughs> And Tahir Nagvi is someone who was one of the first persons to say to me, oh, Muslim has become a racialized identity in this strange way, which is a very sort of within a North American context, but that's also constantly changing, right? The people who subscribe to a Muslim identity, their relationship with that identity is constantly changing also. Um, Shami Ali Naim, a poet, uh, she famously said, she said about the opponent, she said, Islamophobes don't care how religious you are. They don't even care if you're Muslim. Right? Because Muslim is sort of a, it's, it's an all-encompassing uh, container which people can choose to put other people in and people can choose to put themselves in. I think putting yourselves in it is a form of 
solidarity, which is why, for example, when you're talking about Islamic feminism, I'm thinking of what's the Islamic feminism you're working with that I would be working with. So it's shifting, and I don't think we've seen the end of the shifts at all. And I think it shows up a lot in what we're asked to express solidarity with, right? Why the Kurdish movement uh, resonates with some people is also related to their positionality and what their victory would be seen as and what the victory of others might not be seen as. And I think we're in flux about that also. Um, I just want to say, because I had wanted to piggyback on what you said earlier about Islamic feminism, just to say, just to remember the people who passed away, because we lost three really important figures in Islamic feminism and we shouldn't uh, forget to talk about them. Um, Fatima Mirnisi we lost a few years ago. Saba Mahmood we just lost last week who wrote Politics of Piety and super important in sort of turning many people's thought about piety on its head and also Asma Jahangir very, very recently. And so I just want to say in that spirit so that we can remember to support those who are still doing the work and still alive, just want to also highlight, I mentioned this to uh, Tarek, that Kavita Singh, um, art historian at JNU, is part of many um, Indian academics um, and activists who are now under attack by a very right-wing government. Um, she's just been fired and there's now an appeal process. And I think there's a way that what's happening at JNU somehow isn't fitting with the sort of current discourses. So I'm not seeing as many people in my communities talk about what's happening in India. And so I think we should figure out ways to be in solidarity with those who are still alive and need our help from our situations. And discuss the term solidarity in the future. <laughs> <coughs> Next March meeting. Thank you very much. I'm very proud. <laughs>